As you walk the hallways, you really understand how big football was here uh, at that time. And it was a national power. They consistently played the top ranked teams in the country. They played at all the big places, including Yankee Stadium and Polo Grounds. Fordham was probably the most respected program in America at that time. It wasn't just a power from New York. I mean, we went countrywide. They are on a par with, with what Alabama is today. And then the fact that one of perhaps the patron saint of all football, the most famous coach in American history, Vince Lombardi, was one of those seven blocks of granite. And I think that's what solidified that 1936 team as the epitome of Fordham football at its best. You can trace the Fordham football to the very legends of the game. Fordham University, an oasis that sits high atop Rose Hill, is a Jesuit institution located in New York City's Bronx Borough. Here, young and curious minds are molded into future scholars and leaders all around the world. An academic institution first and foremost, its athletic pedigree cannot be ignored. The history of football runs through Fordham. Names like Kavanaugh, Crowley and Lombardi are the backbone of Fordham's glorious past, but without a doubt, remain as ghosts of Fordham's present and future. The game of football was all-consuming on the Fordham campus. The phrase, Rose Hill to Rose Bowl, once echoed through Keating's hallowed halls. Today, that history follows the football team out of the tunnel and onto Coffee Field each and every game. Fordham University was originally founded as St. John's College by Archbishop John Hughes. At his invitation, the Society of Jesus assumed responsibility of the college in 1846. Eventually, athletics would weave itself into Fordham's fabric. Football, a new game, a tough game, was brought into the fold. The first football game occurred at Fordham in 1881. Following the turn of the century, the team would garner more attention from the university and from the Fordham fan base. Under coach Frank Gargan, during the mid-teens, the team achieved significant success. But it was with the arrival of coach Frank Cavanaugh, the Iron Major, that Fordham understood what it meant to be a true powerhouse. He was born in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, he was a great player at Dartmouth. He was a war hero of World War I. Frank Cavanaugh served in World War I and in the Battle of the Argonne. Uh, he was hit with German artillery in the face and mortally wounded. He actually held his, his right eye in his hand. Frank Cavanaugh's life-threatening injuries earned him a Purple Heart during the Great War. But more importantly, it earned him the reputation as a strong-willed patriot on the battlefield which would translate seamlessly to the game of football. And when you're in the military, it's pure discipline. Lives are at stake, and you don't take no for an answer or maybe for an answer. At Fordham, that's the way he, he ran his, uh, his program. He was a tough, tough guy. He's one of those guys who believe that the best players should be in. And in those days, players often played both ways. So the best 11 players may play 60 minutes. One of the guys on the second team was his own son, a pass catching end named Dave, and he didn't get to play much either. He had a lot of uh, sprints and, and drills. His grass drill became Vince Lombardi's drills that he used with the Green Bay Packers. So when you think of Frank Cavanaugh, you can almost trace it right down to a lot of modern day conditioning methods. Though the Iron Majors' first two seasons were rather forgettable, after having posted a three and five record in 1927, and a 4-5 record in 1928. It was his third campaign as Fordham's head coach in 1929 that would create the legend of Frank Cavanaugh. 
After winning the first two games in 1929, Fordham faced off against their crosstown rival, NYU, for a major showdown at the Polo Grounds. Selling out the stadium, Fordham would dominate on both sides of the ball in front of a crowd of over 50,000 New York fans. The, the Fordham program really was announced that game, not only to score 26 nothing, but they packed the stadium. And from then on, they filled the Polo Grounds the 29 campaign would begin with great success, but midway through the season, Wall Street, located just 16 miles from the Rose Hill campus, was in utter chaos. Coach Cavanaugh and his Fordham Rams, however, kept their focus on the field. The common denominator of that era was defense. Of course, the forward pass wasn't used as much, and so the scores were lower. Uh, many times uh, in a single wing formation, the quarterback was a blocker. Now the quarterback is a passer. Uh, the quarterback would lead the play. And in the old days, you'd have a fullback, uh, which would be three yards behind, a, or three or four yards behind the line of scrimmage. And he would usually take the ball and he would spin it uh, or uh, use it for a plunge, as, as they used to call it. So it's, a, it's an entirely different ball game. It was a defense that set them apart. There was crazy scores. They would win two to nothing or six to nothing. And that 29 season began the legacy of the, of the Fordham defense. Led by Captain Tony Ciano, Fordham's line would brutally dismantle opposing offenses. In an era where scoring depended upon the run game, Fordham's adversaries barely stood a chance. They would finish the 1929 and 1930 seasons with a 15-1 and two record undoubtedly emerging as a new powerhouse, having only allowed one rushing touchdown over that two-year span. An AP wire caption would name this unbreakable line, the Seven Blocks of Granite. However, the nickname would not stick. By 1932, the Iron Major's health was seriously declining. The injuries that he suffered back in World War I were finally starting to catch up with Kavanaugh. The face injuries, and in particular the eye injuries, worsened and got to the point where he really couldn't see too well at practice. And so he'd be sort of wandering outside the coach's box there and more than once got knocked over. That season, Michigan State would upset a Rams team without their respected leader at full health. On the other side of the field, a young, up-and-coming coach by the name of Jim Crowley would catch Fordham's attention. Everybody was following that game, and, and Jack Coffey had a big say in who was going to come to Fordham. And he was a likely candidate because he had gone to Notre Dame and had the great reputation. And when the Iron Major passed away the following summer, Jim Crowley was ready to take on the responsibility as Fordham's new head coach. In 1933, after the Iron Major's death, the Rose Hill campus welcomed the new leader of Fordham football. Jim Crowley, the Rams' new head coach, would bring with him an esteemed reputation and a brilliant football mind. When Crowley got to Fordham, it was the beginning of, of a new great era for Fordham football. He brought several of his assistant coaches from Notre Dame with him. Uh, Notre Dame was the premier football place in America, college football of that period. So it was sort of an idea that he was creating Notre Dame East, another Catholic school, a powerhouse on the rise. And so when Crowley got there, he immediately started recruiting some of the better players in the East Coast to come to Fordham. Crowley's ties to the University of Notre Dame were etched in history. As one of Notre Dame's mythological four horsemen, Crowley was paramount to Notre Dame's rise as the premier football program and was forever part of college football lore. There was no doubt that he would bring some of that gravitas to Fordham's team. Crowley tended to recruit players from the toughest working class areas of New England and Pennsylvania. The mill towns of New England, the coal towns of Pennsylvania. That's really where he drew his, his talent from. Anybody in the coal regions was proud of anybody that left the coal region because uh, they knew the hardships that they had. Johnny Kuzman, who was from Coaldale, Crowley came up to visit him and it happened to be 
snowing at that time. And Johnny Kuzman was out at the garbage pail putting some up. Crowley says, I'm looking for John Kuzman. He says, here I am. Johnny Kuzman was very naive, very sincere. And Crowley said, would you mind if I come in? <laughs> Though the majority of Crowley's players tended to come from the small blue-collar towns of New England and Pennsylvania, it was a local New York commuter, a day hop as they were once known, who would change the face of Fordham football forever. Fitz Lombardi grew up in Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn, part of a huge Italian family. His father was a butcher in Manhattan. Uh, his mother, uh, Maddie, was uh, sort of the disciplinarian of the of the family. Vince was the oldest son in a, in a large family and also the oldest cousin. So he was always a, sort of a leader from a very early age. At one point, he, he wanted to be a priest. and He actually went to a seminary school. I think like many young men, he realized that there were parts of going into the priesthood that he couldn't handle. <laughs> Vince Lombardi could have gone to Columbia. His mother was an Izzo, and the Izzo family had a connection to Fordham. I think he was attracted by the Jesuit philosophy of Fordham versus Columbia and it had football on the rise. So I think those three things, the personal connection, the Jesuit connection, and the football all brought Lombardi to Fordham. When Lombardi arrived at Fordham, he, he thought he was a fullback. And Sleepy Jim took one look at him running and said, this guy's too slow. <laughs> He's not going to be a fullback. Lombardi was five nine hundred eighty pounds and he was placed at guard crowley admired lombardi thought he was one of the lesser appreciated good players on his team and because he knew he was such a good leader as well as tough but he did not start his first year and he got injured his second year it wasn't really until the great 36 team that lombardi truly could sh come into his own that 36 team with Vince Lombardi on the line, was the beginning of something truly incredible at Fordham University. It was the making of a team that would become indelible in the eyes of football historians. The line included John Drews, Al Babarski, Vince Lombardi, Alex Wojciechowicz, Natty Pierce, Ed Franco, and Leo Paquin. Together, they would remind college football that Fordham was ready to play under the brightest lights and on the largest stage. The formation of that great 36 team could not have occurred at a more fortuitous time. New York City had become the epicenter of college football. You know, it's shocking to think about today, but in the 1920s, 1930s, New York City was the center of football. In the city itself, you had Fordham, Columbia, and NYU. But in that era, they were at the top. And they were all excellent teams in various years and all very much competing against one another and brought the great teams from the Midwest and the West and the South to New York to play them. New York football was, was almost like the Southeast Conference today. Though New York's love for football continued to grow, it also concealed much deeper worries about the United States economy as well as the possibility of war. I think that if you look at American history, you'll see that that football does serve as a distraction during difficult times. In the 30s, it was both internal with the depression and all the difficulties of just scraping by to make a living, and then the rise of Hitler and the whole world fight between fascism and communism and democracy. There was a lot in the mix at that point. And so football was not just a distraction, but a way to, to sort of keep going. And with so much uncertainty hanging in the balance all across the world, New York football fans turned their focus to their hometown team. There was no doubt that the 1936 Fordham Rams would engrave their names in college football history. <laughs>